Tonight we have um, Professor Casimir de Cusadas yes. from Marist, who is mm -hmm. a renowned expert on cybersecurity. Um, his uh, bio is very long. <laughs> and so I've actually asked him because how he got into this is really quite interesting mm -hmm. to tell us a little about that before he dives into the subject itself. <clears throat> I'll, I'll just mm -hmm. start with the opener that he's been at Marist since. Uh, for since 2014, after a 24-year career at IBM, he got a presidential citation uh, for, on uh, disaster recovery networks which were used at the World Trade Center on 9-11. He's had quite an exciting career. So we'll mm -hmm. hear from okay. him, and he's going to start by telling you a little more about his career, because I think it's fascinating that Marist has become a very important place for the training of people in this field. And the excess of job opportunities mm -hmm. over uh, people actually educated enough to do the jobs is extraordinary. And he's ha helping even the score. OK. So. Wonderful. Thank you, Peter. Thanks very much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, as you heard, my name is Kazmer Dikasadis. Uh, I'm currently an associate professor at Marist College. I'm also their director of cybersecurity education. And Peter asked me to tell a little bit about how I got to that point in my career. Well, I was actually, um, you know, born and raised from a very young age in a small log cabin in northeast Pennsylvania. Uh, I went to Penn State for my undergraduate career. Then I went on to uh, RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic in Albany, New York for my graduate studies, earned my PhD. And at that point, I thought that I had a PhD in the field, which meant that it was time to find a good academic institution and start teaching and doing research. Uh, but then IBM came along, and they offered me a starting position working in Kingston. Uh, and I thought this would be a nice thing to do for a little while while I figured out what my other options were. So 24 years later, uh, I had become an IBM Distinguished Engineer. Uh, I was talking to a lot of their big Fortune 500 clients. Uh, I helped develop fiber optic systems for the mainframe computers. Uh, as Peter said, I worked on the disaster recovery systems that we used on 9-11, uh, the World Trade Center. That's a whole other story. You can tell it. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, time permitting, maybe I will at the end. We'll see. And then after all of that, um, I finally thought if, if I was ever going to get back to teaching, it was about time to do it. So uh, IBM and Marist have a very strong joint study relationship going back over 30 years. I started getting involved with the research program at Marist, and after that, uh, I went over to the faculty full time in 2014, wrapped up a 24 year career at IBM. When I came to Marist, they asked me if I could start up a cybersecurity program because they didn't have cybersecurity courses really before that point. So I pulled together a program that we got approved by the state of New York. We now have a four year Bachelor of Science major in cybersecurity that you can take. We also have a minor in cybersecurity. So if someone wants to study, say, criminal justice or business, they can take a minor in cybersecurity. We have a pre-college program. Every summer we run programs for high school students. They can study cybersecurity and earn college credit. And of course, we also have a certificate program approved by the state of New York. So people who are working professionals in the field can get a certificate from New York State and sort of make a lateral move in their career into the field of cybersecurity. So we built up this program over the course of the past five years. We also have a really active research and development program that I'll tell you a little bit more about later on. And tonight they asked me to talk a little bit about the field of cybersecurity, things that would be interesting to a group of folks like yourselves, some stories ripped from the headlines that talk a little bit about what you should know and why you should be concerned about cybersecurity. 
We also are going to talk a little bit about some of the things my students study and the jobs they get when they graduate and some of the research they're doing in this program as well. But now before I get into all of that, uh, since we're here, lovely Dupuy Canal House Museum, uh, I thought I would just mention a few of the highlights that tie into some of the things that I do in my own field. So I'm sure you've all had a chance to tour the museum, the grounds a little bit. You know about the importance of the canal, you know, over 100 miles, built by hand. It took them three years to construct the thing and get it running. Uh, and at its peak, around 1830 or so, the canal is shipping over 90,000 tons of coal and about 3 million board feet of lumber up from Pennsylvania to New York City every year. Now, that's a huge achievement. And when I read about that, that year, 1830, rang a bell with me. Because it turns out that 1830 is also a very important date in the field of cybersecurity and computer science. Just about the time that the Dupuy Canal was hitting its peak, around the 1830s, early 1830s or so, is about the time that the field of computing was getting started. A fellow by the name of Babbage across the pond in Cambridge, England, was inventing this thing that he called an analytical engine. A series of mechanical gears and pulleys and levers with different gear ratios. Uh, and the idea was that you could feed in a piece of paper tape with holes punched in it. It would read that information in some sense and allow you to do simple calculations like logarithms. It was the world's first programmable computer and Babbage's uh, cohort Ada Lovelace is arguably the world's first computer programmer. So all this is taking place in Cambridge, England at the same time that the canal is being uh, uh, developed into its heyday. And it turns out there's some parallels there as well. There was a lot of new innovation that had to take place for the canal to exist the way it did. There was a lot of innovation people had to think of in order to build the world's first mechanical computer. Computers today don't look like this. They look very different. Also, the people who built the canal were mostly concerned with making it work, with making sure that they could transport all that coal and lumber and other products up to New York City. And Babbage and Lovelace were mainly concerned with making their computing device work. They weren't really thinking so much about security. There wasn't really anything in their early work that suggests they were worried about someone getting access to this thing and misusing it in any way. It just didn't have that capability yet. And unfortunately, that set a trend that we've been following for the past 200 years or so. First, we're going to focus on making this thing work. And later, if there's time, if there's budget, if we feel like it, we'll think about slapping some security on top. Well, when you take those as your priorities, and then you take 200 years of evolution in the field of computing, not surprisingly, you land in the modern day where computer security is a big problem. How big of a problem is it? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> That's the interactive part of the presentation right there if you missed it. <clears throat> Last year, cybercrime cost the world six trillion dollars, trillion with a T. If it was a country, it would be the third largest economy in the world after the US and China. If you added up all the natural disasters that took place last year around the world, hurricanes, floods, wildfires, all of that, it's still 20,000 times less than what we lost due to cybercrime. This is a huge financial problem. Not only is it a huge problem, it's growing. Five years ago, it was 50 times smaller than it is now. By 2025, they think it's going to be up to almost $11 trillion a year that we're losing due to cybercrime. So this is kind of a big deal. Um, and then since computers are so vulnerable to these type of attacks, we've had the bright idea to put them everywhere into everything. There's about 8 billion people on the planet. There's nearly 30 billion devices connected to the internet. 
And remember, not all those people live in first world countries like we do. The whole world doesn't have internet access yet, though we're getting close. So nowadays, we have chips in everything. Okay? Not only the phone that you carry with you, your ring doorbell, your Roomba vacuum cleaner, um, your Fitbit that you wear on your wrist, they all have chips, they're all networked. All of those things can be attacked and all of them can be misused. So we have a problem that is a huge financial drain, it's fast growing and it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. I have a hard time thinking of other things that are man-made problems that are on that big of a scope. Uh, when I'm talking about the financial scope of this, uh, I have to take just a minute and mention this little company. Who knows who Equifax is? A couple of hands? Oh, good. Good. I'm glad to see that. Okay. Um, they're the people who lost half your data in 2017. Don't feel bad. They lost half my data, too. They lost half the data of everybody in North America. If you say, how can they do that if I never heard of them? Well, they are arguably one of the world's largest uh, credit clearing houses. So if you or anyone you know ever got a credit card, ever took out a student loan, ever took out a home mortgage, a loan on your car, anything like that, your local bank outsourced that to an organization like Equifax to do the credit check. And that meant Equifax's database had all your personal data and all your information in it. And when they were hacked in 2017 due to a series of blunders that it would take me much more than an hour to describe, they lost data on all, half the people in this country. So cybersecurity has a huge financial component. A lot of the students who graduate from Marist end up working in the financial industry. They work for big banks on Wall Street, credit card companies, insurance companies, places like that. Um, but that's not the only aspect of cybersecurity that I'm worried about. There's a lot of other things going on at the same time that make this problem even worse. Now I'm going to give some context to this by talking about it in terms of a tipping point effect. And the term tipping point comes from a book that Malcolm Gladwell wrote a number of years ago. Uh, he's talking about the tipping point as being a point where an idea or a trend or a form of behavior goes from being something that only a few people do to being something that everyone accepts and takes for granted. And there's lots of examples of tipping points in his book. You can read it for yourselves. I think cybersecurity, as we know it now, is sitting on the verge of a tipping point, and we don't know quite which way it's going to go. One way it could go is more of the traditional, classical approach to security, the thing we probably all grew up with. The idea is we have a right to a reasonable expectation of privacy. After all, it's in the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. We have a right to reasonably expect safety and security, to be able to trust third parties, banks and other people to be fair and accountable. We can make distinctions between security in the real world, like locking my car door, versus security in cyberspace. And security ought to be something that's baked into everything we do. So like a utility. Classic example of a utility is the electric power company. You flip the switch on the wall, the lights go on. Every time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. When they don't, something unusual is happening. Cybersecurity ought to be like that, that we have it baked into everything that we do. Of course, the other side of the scale is basically the opposite of that, to be very brief. Heck with all that. You don't have a right to privacy. There's no such thing as privacy. It doesn't exist. All your data is out there. Deal with it. Cybersecurity, we'll do it if we have the time. We're not going to do it right here and now. Um, cyberspace, real life, they blur together. Nobody really knows where the line is. Um, don't worry about trusting people. You can't trust anybody. That's the other side. Which one of those is going to become the dominant view of the world in the next couple of years? It's very hard to say. But maybe we can think about it a little if we take some examples of what's going on in the world and try to get some context around this. 
So I'm going to walk you through a couple of things that happened in recent years. You probably remember them from the news headlines in the hopes that we can try to address this issue and try to answer the question I posed on my very first slide. You know, why are we still being hacked in this modern day and age? Well, let's start off by going back to another example of a utility that I just mentioned, the electric power company. Bad enough that cybersecurity deals with financial issues on the scale that I just described, it also hits infrastructure. So people have been saying for many years, someone could attack the computers that control the electric power grid. They could take the utility offline, shut down all the lights on the East Coast. Now that didn't catch on and didn't go over any tipping points for many years. In fact, they told a lot of cybersecurity people like myself to stop fear-mongering about this kind of thing. It's a theoretical concern. Maybe it could happen, but it hasn't yet, and it probably won't. Don't get people worked up about it. And that argument held sway until around the end of 2015. December 2015, we get the first documented cyber attack against an electrical utility. Happened in the Ukraine in Russia. Lights go out, power goes off, for about 400,000 people in the middle of the Russian winter when it's 40 below zero outside. And it's directly traced back to the software that they were running in the power plant. Turns out some people abused one of the interfaces that they used to do remote maintenance and help desk services to take over the computers and shut down all the power. Well, now that we have a use case, you'd think people would be more concerned, and they were but still not too concerned. The tipping point still hasn't moved yet. They would say, well, it was only one event. Maybe that was just a one-off. Maybe it was a coincidence. Maybe it won't happen again. And then about a year later, it happened again. Only it hit three times as many people. And a year later than that, it happened again. And then it started happening on almost an annual basis to the point where people started saying, why are they hacking the power systems in the Ukraine every year. The Russian word for it is uh, polygon, practice field. They're rehearsing. They're getting ready for the time when they're going to have to do this on a larger scale. Now, a couple of years later, 2017, they asked the current um, Secretary of State of the United States. What are we doing to make sure stuff like that uh, doesn't happen to our power systems in this country? And the Secretary of State said, why should the American people be concerned about something that's happening on the other side of the world in Russia? I know, right? My students at Marist could have told you why. Because what happens over there today is going to happen here tomorrow. And in a stroke of irony that I couldn't make up if I tried, a month after he made that statement was when we had the first documented cyber attack against a power plant in the US. Wolf Creek Nuclear Power Plant, Burlington, Kansas, gets hacked May of 2017 using a variant of the same malware that was used in the Ukraine two years before. So now people are starting to change their minds just a little bit. Okay. It's happening here in the heartland of the U.S. in the middle of Kansas. And this has been ongoing over the past couple of years. I don't have the time to tell you about every single cyber attack that's happened, but you get the idea. Okay, so the power plants aren't safe. What else is in danger? Well, there was a major piece of ransomware that went around roughly the same time. 2017 was a lousy year for cybersecurity. This ransomware was something called uh, the WannaCry virus. Now, ransomware means that the bad guys put some software on your computer without your consent. They encrypt all your data using heavy encryption. You can't get at it. If you ever want to see your data again, you've got to pay some Bitcoin to some address they give you. Got to pay the ransom. WannaCry was one of the biggest ransomware scams ever. And one of the reasons it was so effective is because they were using exploits that were stolen from the National Security Agency here in the US. Turns out that 
A number of years prior to this, the NSA had sort of made an informal arrangement with Microsoft to ask them not to patch certain bugs in their operating system so there will be a back door for people to monitor communications and things of that nature. And it turns out that leaked and the bad guys got a hold of it, as they inevitably do. And the next thing you know, they have this ridiculously effective way to put encryption on your computer. Now, this got really bad in most of the world. Luckily, it wasn't that bad here in the US because we figured out how to stop it before it got here. Uh, this guy down in the corner, named Marcus Hutchins, 23 years old, figured out a way to slow and stop this thing. There's a whole separate story about him that I don't have time to tell now either. But the point is that hospitals and medical centers were especially vulnerable. What's a hospital's mission? Taking care of sick people, hiring good doctors, maybe doing medical research, buying new MRI equipment. There's nothing in the budget to upgrade the computers, to put in cybersecurity specialists. So a lot of hospitals, especially in Europe, were running outdated software that was vulnerable to this kind of an attack. So hospitals start shutting down all across the United Kingdom, all across Asia, because of WannaCry. Now think about that for a second. You or somebody that you care about has a heart attack. Seconds count when you're treating heart attacks. You call 911, the ambulance pulls up out front, they load your loved one inside of it, they race off to the nearest hospital, and halfway there, the dispatcher gets on the radio and says, don't bring them. You've got to go to this other hospital 45 minutes away. They say, wait a minute, what do you mean? I've got a heart attack victim in the back. I know, but we can't treat them. Why not? All our systems are down because of this virus attack. We can't admit anybody to the hospital. The admission systems are all down. We can't access their medical records to check their allergies or anything else. We can't operate because the operating theaters are all computer controlled and all those systems are frozen. We can't do blood transfusions because the blood samples are kept in computer controlled refrigerators in the basement and those are offline. So we don't know if the blood supply is good or not. It was really bad. You didn't hear as much about it in the US. It was terrible in the United Kingdom and big parts of Europe, big parts of Asia as well. So again, we've got a fundamental piece of infrastructure, medical care, that's under attack. A bunch of the students who graduate from Marist now are going to work in the healthcare industry, they're getting jobs working at hospitals or they're working for healthcare and insurance people up in Connecticut and elsewhere trying to stop stuff like this from happening again. Now, the same story repeats itself over and over. Pick a major portion of infrastructure that you think we depend on, and the bad guys go after it. February of 2021, water treatment plant in Florida gets hacked using this backdoor in Microsoft Teams again. Some bad guys dump poisonous levels of sodium hydroxide into the water supply. Luckily, it gets caught by other sensors and things before it gets out to the general public. But yes, they're trying to poison the water supplies. May of 2021, Colonial Pipeline. I'm sure you all remember this. If you think the Depoy Canal was impressive, 100 miles, 90,000 tons of coal, Colonial Pipeline is over 5,000 miles long, carries 3 million barrels of oil a day, and they got shut down because someone clicked on a link they shouldn't have clicked on in an email and launched a piece of ransomware into their system that encrypted all the servers and locked the whole system down. Gasoline shortages in half a dozen states in the southeast US for a couple of days. Okay. Power plants, oil, water, sewage, you name it. And then they really crossed the line. Then they went for something that I could hardly believe they had the guts to go after. I, I can't even bring myself to do it. They, <laughs> give me a minute. I just need to moment of silence for the Duncan. Uh, I can see some confusion. Maybe I should explain. Why did I put Duncan Donuts on the slide? Well, yes, they were attacked. The bad guys hacked Dunkin' Donuts. They went into the loyalty program. 
This little thing that you can check on your phone that says, you know, you buy 10 cups of coffee, you get one for free. Now, why did they do that? Is it because the bad guys want to get free coffee from Dunkin' Donuts and who would blame them? That's not really the motivation. They're doing it because they know that a lot of people use the same email and the same password on all their credentials. So they do an attack called credential stuffing. As soon as they steal your Dunkin' Donuts loyalty stuff, they run off and try that password on all the major banks, all the major credit cards, all the airlines, and they hit about 5 or 6% of them and get free access to the accounts and drain them and then go on their way. It's more than enough to keep them in business. And it's a lot easier to hack Dunkin' Donuts and get your password than it is to hack the bank directly. You start to see why cybersecurity is so hard. We can do a lot of stuff to secure the banks, firewalls, artificial intelligence, all sorts of things. But if you use the same password that you use for everything else, the bad guys will go after the weakest link in that chain, and before long they own all your accounts. That's one of the reasons cybersecurity is so hard to do. Okay. Earlier I talked about putting chips in everything. right? your Fitbit, your thermostat, your vacuum cleaner. Late 2016, somebody decided those things were pretty easy to hack because there's very little security on your smart doorbell or your smart thermostat or your Roomba vacuum cleaner or your DVR or your baby monitor. We're spending all our time making it work, remember. Security is an afterthought. It's very easy to hack those things, so let's hack a lot of them. And then let's corral them all together into a network that we call a botnet. And then at a predetermined time, we'll tell that botnet to start attacking a certain target. In this case, it was a service provider, a company called DIN, D-Y-N. They happen to handle all the traffic for all the major social networks that you're familiar with. So the botnet sets a world record over a terabit per second of data pounding away at this poor service provider. They can't respond. So for the better part of a day, the east coast of the US loses Twitter, Amazon, Netflix, Spotify, Reddit, Tumblr, and a whole bunch of other services. Not because those services were hacked, not because the provider DIN was hacked, but because someone went after half a million Internet of Things devices with no security on them and corralled them together and weaponized it. And this is still a big concern for us in the cybersecurity field. People are starting to wise up to this. Um, you have books like the ones that are shown on my slide that are being published. Some of my students are starting to work for these Internet of Things companies to help out, but it's still in its very early stages. Okay? Again, prior to 2016, People would have said, hypothetically, that could work, but let's not get excited about it. Nowadays, the scales are starting to tip a little bit as we see attacks like this happening in the wild. Then there's a the dark web. Everybody's heard about the dark web, right? It's on the cover of Time magazine. The dark web, I've never seen a more wretched hive of scum and villainy <laughs> than the dark web. The part of the internet that isn't indexed by Google and Amazon and everybody else. The part of the internet that is not policed, that we don't know exactly how big it is. Now there's a couple of things out there that might have some value. Uh, it turns out that if you want to give an anonymous tip to the New Yorker, you want to be a whistleblower for your company, you don't have to hide in a parking garage at 3 a.m. anymore. You go on the dark web. New York Times has a strong box. New Yorker has a strong box. Everybody has a strong box out there. You can drop anonymous tips and be a whistleblower without getting caught. That's nice. Unfortunately, I'm going to say like 90 to 95 percent of the rest of the dark web is illegal activity. Anything you can think of in the real world that's illegal activity, it's out there on the dark web. This is a site from Silk Road. They're one of the leading online drug dealers. They shut them down a few years ago. They're still chasing some of the uh, people who were running the whole thing. Uh, but you could go online onto the dark web. You could pick the illegal drug of your choice. 
pay them with some Bitcoin, which gets money laundered online so it's untraceable. They hide the thing inside a cereal box or a soup can and they drop ship it to you from somewhere else in the world. And they were doing hundreds of millions of dollars a year in online drug trade before the FBI caught them and shut down Silk Road. That doesn't mean there's no drugs left on the dark web. Of course there is. There's everything on the dark web. If you can think of it, you can buy it out there. Illegal guns, you want a US passport without having to apply for one. You're into child pornography, you're into human trafficking, all that and more. You say you want to attack somebody but you don't have any computer skills, no problem. You can rent someone to do the attack for you. So for example, if you're in Europe, for 50 euros we'll screw around with somebody. For 200 euros we'll take their passwords. Hand it over to you, you do what you will with them. For 400 euros, we will bankrupt your victim. We'll steal their passwords and we'll go into their bank accounts and we'll drain it, donate some of it to charity, transfer some of it overseas and it'll be gone. For 500 euros, we'll ruin their life. We'll hack their computer, fill their hard drive with child pornography and drop a tip to the authorities. All this kind of stuff is out there. It's scary. Nobody knows exactly how big the dark web is or exactly how much of this stuff is out there, but people who have researched this have found enough of it to make us nervous. Right? This is a big deal. So all this stuff is going on. They're coming after the money, after the infrastructure. They're selling all this stuff on the dark web. And then there's cyber war. Another one that a few years ago people said, well, I guess the next time there's a big conflict, computers will play a role. It happened. The most recent example, situation over in the Ukraine. February of this year when Russia invaded the Ukraine, uh, they went online and said, we're calling for volunteers for an information technology army. We need digital skills for an IT army to help us resist the Russian invasion. A couple of days later, they got almost 200,000 people signing up. They put them to work running virus attacks against Russia, denial of service attacks against Russian websites, going against Russian propaganda sites and knocking them offline, uh, trying to hack the energy companies and shut off the lights and things like that, going after third parties, right? So companies who are doing business in Russia and who refuse to back out after the invasion are getting hacked and getting their data leaked all over the dark web as part of this ongoing conflict. And then things start happening that have never happened before. How many of you have heard of an organization called ICANN? I can. Carolyn, you don't count. I know you know it. Anybody? <laughs> Other, a couple of hands went up, right? ICANN is one of those organizations that you never heard of that runs the internet. International Consortium of Assigned Names and Numbers. ICANN is the group that controls your computer's virtual network address, the IP addresses, the domain servers, which are like the phone books of the internet. And after Russia invaded the Ukraine, there was a formal petition made to ICANN to shut Russia off from the internet. Stop all internet traffic in and out. They could do it. Make no mistake. All they have to do is shut down the directory servers and the IP addresses and the service providers. They could cut Russia off from the global internet. And it would do a lot of damage. It would really hurt. And there was a big debate on this, which is still going on in some circles. A lot of people said, well, yes, but you're also going to hurt a lot of innocent people. You're going to cripple. Russian commerce and economy, a lot of folks are going to suffer. Maybe we don't want to set a precedent of doing this for the very first time. So I can back away from that cliff. They said we're not going to take the responsibility for deciding who should be on the internet and who shouldn't. Our job is to enable internet connectivity for everyone. Fair enough. Um, that doesn't mean that other people didn't try. You probably heard of this collective of hackers called Anonymous. 
uh, they announced they were going to go to war with Russia. Now, that's unprecedented. Who is anonymous? Well, it's this loose collective of hackers that support social causes generally. Uh, no one knows exactly how many there are or who the ringleaders are. They're spread all over the world. Um, they don't have boundaries or territories. They're not part of the United Nations. They're not a country or a corporation. And yet, they decided we're going to attack Russia. And they did. And it hurt. And they're making a big impact. So service providers like DIN and Cloudflare and others end up pulling out of Russia or getting forced offline by Anonymous. So even if they're not technically shut off from the internet, uh, Apple Pay doesn't work in Russia anymore, Google Pay doesn't work anymore, none of the online services on your phone work anymore, and on and on. This collective of hackers who took the position that this war was unethical and had to be stopped are having a huge impact against one of the largest countries in the world. Well, you can't fight them with conventional means. You can't shoot missiles at them. You can't threaten to nuke them. We don't know where they are. Um, Russia's trying to fight back using the same tools in cyberspace. This is a picture of Vladimir Bondarenko. He's a blogger from Kiev hates the Ukrainian government, welcomes our Russian liberators, and he doesn't exist. His face was created by an artificial intelligence system. His Facebook and other profiles were generated by a machine learning system. And he was a product of a Russian troll farm trying to spread propaganda during the war. Facebook outed him and a couple of thousand other people not long ago. They have a website now called thispersondoesnotexist.com which is full of fake people who have been made up. And they make up a profile and a biography. They make up um, posts that these people make and comments other people make. It looks real. It's part of their disinformation campaign. Playing on the same kind of emotions that people do when they call you on the phone and try to sell you an extension on your car warranty. I know you know what I mean. I see you nodding out there. So this is what warfare is coming to. Not only the conventional stuff. People are using artificial intelligence, social engineering, machine learning techniques to push propaganda, to try to sway public opinion, especially in Western countries where we still use elections to decide what our policies are going to be. This type of stuff is big business for them. There are huge troll farms, as are known in Russia, people building this software and pushing it. People in Anonymous and such are pushing back. Okay. Anonymous had a really successful campaign recently where they made fake Facebook profiles for pretty girls and targeted Russian soldiers. You go up on Facebook and they say, oh, I'd love to see a man in uniform. They say, oh, let me show you a picture of myself standing in front of my tank. Thank you. OK, that's in Russian AK-47 tank. Let's see, those things have a range of about 10, 20, 25 miles or so when the tank is full. I can see one of the spires of the church in the background. You must be within a 50 mile radius of such and such a city. And oh, I see the little logo on your shirt. OK, you're with the 15th Infantry. Let's see, last time we looked, 15th Infantry had about 1,500 people. OK, so Russia's got 1,500 people stationed within such miles of this capital. And so it goes. Start chatting with them, you'll get even more information. Just like when they call you on the phone, you shouldn't talk to them because they're trying to steal information from you. They'll say, oh, I'm, I'm so thrilled for you. It must be dangerous going into battle. Oh, yes, we're getting ready to roll out tomorrow morning, big mission. Really, where are you going? Oh, we have an important mission to take out a bridge. And really, a bridge within range of? Yeah. That's how they gather intelligence nowadays. It blurs the line between reality and cyberspace, which brings me to cryptocurrency. You've heard of this, I'm sure. Right? If I have a physical object in front of me, I can tell you whether it's real or fake. I used to do this example with baseball cards. Now I do it with Pokemon cards because I'm up on what all the hip kids are doing in school. But 
my example remains the same. We go out on the hallway after class and we start trading these little Pokemon cards to play this game. And the card is a physical asset. So I can tell if it's a real card or a fake. You can't draw it with a crayon, I'll know that it's fake. The dollar bills in your wallet are the same way. They've got watermarks and colored metal threads woven into the fabric. It's very hard to counterfeit real money. But now what if all that goes online? What if it's all digital? Okay. Suppose I claim that I have this card, right? Mint condition, holographic, shadowless, first edition Charizard. This thing is worth 5,000 bucks in the real world if you got it. I'm not kidding. It's an ultra rare Pokemon card. If I'm in the virtual world, how do I know that this thing is real or you just made a copy of it? And how do I know you didn't make a thousand copies and you're trying to sell them to everybody as if they were the only one in the world? And if I'm doing the same thing but with money, how do I know that you're not pretending to be a multimillionaire when you're really not? The line between reality and cyberspace is starting to blur. Okay? Uh, if you'll permit me, Sene Pasun Charizard. A couple of you laughed. I had a bet with somebody that at least one person would laugh. Somebody got the reference. This is subtle. Back in 1929, an artist named Rene Magret made a pencil drawing of a pipe, and underneath it he wrote in French, Sene Pasun Pipe. This is not a pipe. People say, what do you mean? Well, of course it's not a pipe. It's a picture of a pipe. Magrette was one of the people who started this dichotomy between is it a picture or does it have additional meaning? Is it the real thing or is it a copy? How do I tell? Is this a real digital Charizard or is this a cleverly made copy? Well, lots of people are going into efforts to try to prove in the digital world that it's unique. Cryptocurrency is based on that idea, and it's struggling right now because they're having a hard time with that. They would love to be able to say, I could make this digital image unique. It's not the same as every image in the world. It's the only one of its kind. It's non-fungible. And that gets us into the world of non-fungible tokens, or NFTs, something cybersecurity people didn't have to worry about 10 years ago. Now it's on that scale, trying to find the tipping point. An NFT is simply just a picture. It has value because somebody thinks it has value. You thought that it was ridiculous that the Pokemon card was selling for $5,000? At least that's a physical card. These are digital images. Somebody made on a computer with AI. And some of them are selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars. Back in 1830, Ada Lovelace wrote what we call the Lovelace Leap which was the idea of saying that numbers can be used for something other than counting. Numbers can be used to represent anything in the real world. Pictures, music, voice, you name it. And Lovelace never dreamed that we were going to get to the place that we are now. People trying to prove that this one picture of a monkey is unique from every other picture of a monkey like it in the world, and therefore it has value because of its uniqueness. Now, I'm a big skeptic of NFTs, if it hasn't shown already. I don't think this stuff really works. I wouldn't advise you to invest in it. But you've got to be aware of it. So I have students who are studying things like uh, blockchain, which is a database that stores these things, and NFT security methods, and other things that we use in the world of cryptocurrency. In case you thought the Pokemon thing was a spurious example, Recently, some folks took digital images of Pokemon cards and tried to run exactly the scam that I described to you, stole $700,000 from people all around the world before they shut down the site and made a run for it. You know, we never did catch them. They're still chasing them since last February. Went out on the dark web someplace. I don't have time to go through all of these. If you want to know more about this sort of stuff, there are websites devoted to it. This business of cryptocurrency and NFTs is part of what they call Web 3.0. That 
That's a snazzy term. So you can go to websites like one of my favorites. Web3 is going just great. It is definitely not an enormous grift that's pouring lighter fluid on an already smoldering planet. Every day, people are losing hundreds of thousands of dollars against stuff like this. This is what we're up against as cybersecurity professionals. We've got to protect those people and those assets as well. And then, of course, it doesn't sit still. It keeps changing. Babbage and Lovelace invented a computer, and they invented a way to represent data in bits, ones and zeros. And a while later, people realized I could represent data in other ways, not using numbers, but using quantum states of phosphorus atoms and things like that. Now, again, you could take a course in quantum computing 10, 15 years ago. You would have learned how to do matrix and tensor multiplication and some quantum physics, and that was it, because no one had built a working quantum computer until about five years ago. This is the IBM Q System 1. We have one of them in Poughkeepsie, New York, about half an hour away from where I work. I teach a class in quantum computing at Marist to my cybersecurity students, so they can program this thing and use quantum computing principles to solve problems that you couldn't solve any other way. It's a fundamentally different architecture than every other computer on the planet. Now, right now, it's in its infancy. The quantum computers we have today are about as sophisticated as the one that Babbage and Lovelace built back in 1830. But they're growing fast. Every year, they get bigger and bigger. And we've already discovered some algorithms that are going to be really interesting in the next couple of years. Uh, it turns out one of the big applications for quantum computing is it can break encryption. All the cryptography that you use on your credit cards to keep things secure, three trillion dollar global economy that we buy online from Amazon every year, all that goes out the window as soon as we can build a big enough one of these. Maybe five to ten years away. So now we have to study quantum computing, and we have to find out ways to develop new forms of encryption to protect ourselves. So as if all that other stuff wasn't bad enough, it's not standing still. There's new tech coming all the time. Did I mention this was a hard problem to solve? There's a classic quote that some people use in commencement exercises, and they say more than at any other time in our history, mankind is standing at a crossroads. Down one path, we have despair, failure, utter hopelessness. The other path leads to total extinction. <laughs> Let us hope we have the wisdom to choose correctly. <clears throat> so I realize that at this point, we've painted a fairly bleak picture. right? I'm actually somewhat optimistic about this area, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, as another one of my mentors said, knowledge is the most important thing. Okay? The only evil is ignorance. The only good is knowledge. We are not headed down a path where both roads lead to destruction because we haven't crossed that threshold of the tipping point yet. We haven't yet given in to all those forces I was describing on the previous slides that say, the lights are going to go off tomorrow, the water is going to be poisoned, and everything else is going to break. There's still too much other stuff pushing back the other way. Yes, Equifax lost data on half the people in North America. Congressional hearings were held. A lot of people said you folks were just plain stupid. That was on the front page of Bloomberg. New state and federal laws were passed to make sure it doesn't happen again. Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, bit of an issue, burning up all the energy resources of the planet. This past year, New York State passes a law, moratorium on Bitcoin mining until we can find a more energy efficient way to do it. Okay. Colonial pipeline was hacked, sure. A few months later, the FBI got two and a half million dollars of the ransom back. Quantum computers are going to break cryptography, sure. That's why we're building quantum safe cryptography. This past May, IBM announces a new mainframe, the Z16, with the world's first quantum safe cryptography. 
IBM sponsoring research at Marist right now looking at applications of quantum computing. They're also sponsoring research looking at the next generation of network time protocols, which is a whole other talk. If you can screw up the clock on your computer, you can do untold damage. So this is a shot of me and one of my students at a conference in Denver this past year and the paper we wrote explaining to everybody who's building computer timing systems all the flaws that we found in our labs that break the clock on your computer and how to fix them. There's a lot going on on the other side of those scales to balance all the bad stuff we were talking about. We train students in our security operations center at Marist. It's a big room just like you'll find in any of the big banks on Wall Street. About 40 desks in there. Everyone has a Mac, Linux, and Windows computer. Four big computers up front with these wall-sized screens that you see. We look at heat maps that find attacks coming in against Marist from all over the world. I've got a couple of short and hopefully humorous YouTube videos out there if you want to check it out. Just Google um, YouTube Marist Cybersecurity or Marist in my name and it'll come right up. And these students are good. We are going to national and international conferences worldwide and winning award after award after award. I can't say enough about my students. I'm very proud of them. This group over here on the side, they graduated last year. They formed a startup company. They wrote a game that would train people in good practices of cybersecurity. And they went to the Mid-Hudson Business Plan competition to seek funding and support. And now they're making a go of it to try to start their own company. We go to major national and global conferences all over the place. And our students get recognized for their security work. And every year we sponsor the Mid-Hudson IEEE Cybersecurity Ethics Competition. Because learning tech without ethics is like learning how to operate a car without learning the rules of the road. So we make it a point to teach you ethical behavior on top of everything else. So getting back to my original question, why are we still getting hacked? Because cybersecurity is really, really, really hard. Okay? The bad guys only need to find one vulnerability, one reused password from Dunkin' Donuts, and they're into your whole system. New tech coming out all the time, like Fitbits and things that we have to keep an eye on. Um, the bad guys have gotten much better organized. Governments, nation states with essentially infinite resources going after targets nowadays. New tech like quantum computing promising to break encryption. And there's a shortage of people who know how to do cybersecurity. About four million jobs going unfilled. That's been the case for several years, not likely to change soon. On the other side of the scale, we're doing better and better all the time at stopping this stuff. Yeah, there's all sorts of new tech to keep track of. That also means we can defend more with fewer people. We're also running education programs like the stuff at Marist College in an effort to close that four million person gap. The attackers have gotten better organized, so have we. We can defend huge perimeters now with only a small number of resources using machine learning and artificial intelligence tools. Quantum computer systems might break encryption. We just announced the first quantum resistant memory encryption on an IBM mainframe. The scales are still balanced. We haven't yet tipped the scales in favor of saying everything's broken, but we also haven't tipped the scales in favor of saying cybersecurity is an inherent right built into everything. It's a very interesting time in this field because we're in this precarious balance not only for the technology but for our attitude towards this. What will we accept from security? from privacy, from the lawmakers in the next couple of years. It's a really interesting time to be in the field. And there's much, much more going on than I had time to talk about tonight. But I'm glad that I did have a chance to give you at least some perspective of what goes on in my field, some of the jobs that my students are getting out there. And if you'd like to know more, feel free to get a hold of me afterwards. We're always interested in collaborative opportunities, talking to people about new ideas, and presenting this kind of work to the public. 
So I want to thank everybody for your time, your attention showing up tonight.